So tonight's lecture is on metastatic bone disease. And the slides aren't, there you go. Um, yeah, okay, so metastatic bone disease. But before we begin, and you would have seen this slide many times, I'd just like to make you aware and beware of the young patient who you think has metastatic disease. Please think twice and um, please get a lot of information, a lot of work up before proceeding with something like a nail. This particular gentleman was 19 at the time of his diagnosis. Uh, the current surgeon, well, his previous surgeon assumed it was metastatic disease and put a nail down without biopsying the patient. It turned out to be a Ewing sarcoma. The patient had to have a total femoral replacement, developed sciatic nerve injury, um, regional complex regional pain syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. So the consequences are, are dire. So metastatic disease, as I'm sure you all are aware, is usually a disease of middle-aged to elderly people, not young people. That being said, of course, young people can get cancers, which can be metastatic. But before plunging in with surgery, please work the patient up first. Uh, I think some of you may have heard of GERFT. It's, a, it's a quite a common term in the UK at the moment. It stands for get it right first time. And Tim Briggs was, uh, is leading this charge. Um, and he was where I did my fellowship at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. And it pertains to most things um, and in orthopedics and of course in metastatic bone disease. You want to get it right the first time because by and large, these patients do not have very long to live. Okay, usually metastatic disease implies stage four, which implies a poor prognosis. And the goals here are to treat them in the best way possible so that they stay at home with their family and their friends and they're not spending a lot of time in hospital. So if we get it wrong and what we do fails and they have to come back, that's not a good thing. And always just consider or put yourself in the patient's shoes and in their family's shoes. And it really is important not to rush into these things. It's not like a NOF where the evidence is you should operate within 24 hours. And um, there's a good evidence here to take your time to complete the workup and to give the patient a good solid treatment. The basic principles are that, as I've mentioned, the patient and the family are in a desperate situation. This may be the first time that they've been diagnosed or heard about their cancer, and they need to be treated with a lot of respect. And we want to do the right thing for them because there are lots of things we can do for them. It's not simply refer to palliative care put on morphine, put a nail down and forget about the problem. There are a lot of things that we can do both surgically and oncologically. When I say that, I mean medically oncologically that can help the patient live pain-free for a number of years. And as I said, it's usually palliative, but do not write the patient off. Um, Decision-making is complex. Um, I'm relatively new to my career, so I'm learning a lot of these things. But often, it's uh, a tough decision made at an MDT, which for those of you who've forgotten, MDT stands for Multidisciplinary Team, with a lot of, of uh, senior oncologists, surgeons, pathologists, etc. So it's not always easy to get it right. Having said this, I have to admit, it's a little bit like an anaesthetist preparing to dope a sickish patient. And there's a whole lot of faff and uh, echoes being asked for, ECGs being asked for, lung function tests being asked for, and at the end of the day, they give a little bit of propofol and put in an LMA. So a lot of the time, it's similar with metastatic bone disease where there's a whole big discussion back and forth, 
And in the end, we put something simple like a nail down or a total hip down. But it's worth having that discussion because in a small number of cases, we can make a very big difference to the patient's overall prognosis. And there's a lot of things we can do. And um, just to reiterate, this is urgent surgery, but not emergence, not an emergency. So there is time to work the patient up and to do it safely and correctly. So start with your assessment of the patient. It's very different in these three scenarios, how the patient presents to you and what you do. The first scenario is a patient that's known with breast cancer, for example, and is known with widespread metastatic disease. In that case, the decision-making is fairly simple. One can cherry-pick the met metastases that are causing the problem and try to sort those out, whether it be with surgery, radiation therapy, or systemic therapy like palliative chemotherapy or bisphosphonates. The second scenario is you have a patient with a known primary, so they've had breast cancer, they've had it treated however long ago, five, six, seven, eight years ago, and this is their first presentation of metastatic disease. And this is a little bit more tricky because in about 7% of cases, it may be a second cancer or a sarcoma, or it may be the patient may have only solitary or oligometastatic disease. And the trend towards treating this type of metastatic disease is becoming more aggressive because with a small burden of disease, a lot can be done and the patient can potentially be curative. And the third situation is when this is their first time presenting with cancer. So they have an unknown primary and they have metastatic disease. And this is unfortunately in the state sector a lot of the time. That's why we have an unknown primary clinic and we have to do a, a basic screening workup like mammogram, like thyroid exam, like prostate exam, et cetera. And in this situation, then of course the patient needs a lot more extensive workup. He needs to see probably more than one doctor and um, and of course the psychology will be different as well. The workup of a patient with metastatic bone disease is very similar to that of a patient who has a sarcoma and I hope that most of you know by now that that involves local and systemic staging. And local, local staging of a metastasis usually starts with an x-ray which in my view is a very good examination to start with because it tells you it's cheap, it's readily available, but it also tells you the extent of the bone loss, which is critical in making a decision regarding surgery versus something like an MRI scan, which can often look aggressive, but does not necessarily show the extent of the bone loss and the fracture risk. So it always starts with an x-ray, but an MRI scan is very useful because it can show you more and it can show you small lesions that are not picked up on x-ray. This is useful both for monitoring and for potential decision making. For example, it excludes a solitary lesion and can confirm oligometastases, in which case that may change your decision making. For example, you may have a met in the proximal femur and a very small met in the acetabulum. And if these are the patient's only two mets, then you can address both of these with surgery. The systemic staging can take the form of a whole body MRI scan or as is more commonly done, a bone scan a technician 99 bone scan. And in scenario two and three of what I've explained to you, these are important. And then a biopsy. So again, in scenario two, where this is the first diagnosis of metastatic bone disease, a biopsy is important. 
to prove the metastatic disease and to exclude an, a secondary cancer or other pathology. A biopsy can also be useful in scenario one where you have known cancer and metastatic disease because occasionally on treatment, something like breast cancer can change its status. So you may have known metastatic bone disease and you can have mets throughout the skeleton and the patient and the initial biopsy can show that the patient is does not have um, is hormone receptor negative, but after treatment, this, station, this uh, status can change and the patient can become positive, and this opens up another um, set of treatments that are available to the patient. So, very occasionally, oncologists ask us to re biopsy the patient to, to try and get this information. Often, these patients are elderly and unwell because they have comorbidities and they have cancer. The illness can be from the cancer itself. And of course, we all know very well hypercalcemia and its effects and its severity, but the cancer itself can cause other things such as bone marrow suppression, causing low counts on your FBC, um, and then, of course, the cancer treatment can cause things like tumor lysis syndrome. Brain metastases can cause things like dizziness and unbalance, which you need to know when rehabilitating your patient. For example, if you do a total hip replacement, the patient has brain metastases. You need to know this. You need to tell the physio because that will affect how you rehab the patient. The patient is, as I said before, usually elderly has comorbidities which need to be controlled. And of course, if the patient has had breast cancer, for example, has had chemotherapy, they may have uh, organ dysfunction because of that. And you need to know about it because the anesthetist and the physician will need to know. It's also important to assess the prognosis of the patient. And we often ask our oncologists and most of the time, it's a thumbsuck. They look at what type of cancer the patient has, the degree to which the cancer has metastasized, and what treatment options are available for the patient, and they come up with a number. However, as you can imagine, this is not very scientific. And there are scoring systems which are in development that try to give you a slightly more accurate number to deal with in order to try to guide your management of the patients, um, specifically surgical management. Do you spend a lot of time, effort and money in replacing the patient's proximal femur if they've got a long time to live or do you put in an iron nail with cement if there is a short time to live? So these scoring systems are very useful. They look at the patient's functional status. They look at some blood parameters like hemoglobin, albumin, ESR, CRP, absolute lymphocytes count, et cetera. Um, and they also take into account the type of primary. Simplistically, for example, lung cancer has a worse prognosis than breast cancer. However, there are different types of lung cancer that carry their own prognosis. So it's not quite as simple as that. But the type of prime, the, the important part is that the type of primary plays a role. As I've alluded to before, the number of METs, solid, solitary or oligometastases, trend towards a more aggressive treatment pattern. Widespread, more cherry picking. It's quality as a balance between quality of life and morbidity of the treatment. For example, can you get away with a total hip replacement? Or do you do a much wider resection and replace the proximal femur? One has a much better functional and rehab pathway. And the other one is a much bigger surgery with a much longer rehab um, and complication rates. So one needs to bear these in mind. And our end game is to get the patient pain-free, functional back at home. I won't touch, 
I will only touch on this, I won't go into too much detail, but the medical oncology treatment, of course, is chemotherapy, which is usually palliative in these situations. And there are many more newer agents on the market, sadly very expensive and only available to those with lots of money, such as the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but they can keep the metastatic disease at bay for many years and are very effective. Radiotherapy is a little bit different to that of um, the treatment of primary disease, primary sarcomas, primary carcinomas, in that it is more field orientated, like a hemipelvic radiation field rather than a targeted radiation. And of course, it is in a lower dose and is given in far fewer fractions, okay? Maybe one or two fractions, whereas your sarcoma treatment may be 20 or 30 fractions. And the other um, medical treatment available, which you may have seen, is of course denosumab and bisphosphonates. So coming to the interesting part of the talk, uh, what is the surgical treatment that we are going to give to these patients and how do we decide on which is the best surgical option? With all of these things, it really is to individualize to the patient because every patient is different in terms of their medical um, health and their metastases is always diff different, whether it be in size, whether it be in aggressiveness um, and location. But as a general rule, endoprosthetics, although more expensive, have a better durability and a lower reoperation rate, if you can believe that, with regard to internal fixation. Internal fixation for me is a very poor choice a surgical choice in these situations because it does not solve the problem. It does not allow, it's a load sharing device usually, and um, it leaves most of the metastasis there. It's often not structurally sound. The patient goes home on crutches, partial weight bearing, and in pain, where if you do something a bit more aggressive like an endoprosthetic, the patient can weight bear immediately the pain is you the metastatic pain is usually gone sure they have a incisional pain but that pain gets better quickly and they are much more functional so part of the surgery is to take biopsies regardless if you know the type of cancer or not because there are other things that we look for such as hormone status but it's there to confirm the metastasis the type of metastasis if you're not sure of the primary cancer and to give other information. Intermedullary nailing, joint replacement, and endoprosthetic replacement are the mainstay of treatments with plating coming in in a few scenarios, mainly of the upper limb. But iron nailing supports bone. Please don't forget the metastasis itself. For example, if you have a diaphyseal lesion with a lytic metastasis, it's although it takes more time and is more difficult to do and increases the bleeding risk of the patient. Patients who have their, their MET curataged out and cement placed in that defect have much better pain scores than if you were just to nail the lesion, leave the defect and hope that radiation is going to do the job. The radiation doesn't, is not curative here. It does not destroy the entire MET because it's given as a bigger field and at a lower dose. So it essentially dampens down the growth pattern of the metastasis, but does not cause 100% necrosis. And also with a fracture, you, there are very low healing rates. So don't expect your nail to unite or the fracture that your nail is put into to unite like a normal trauma fracture. It will not do that. And there is no ro role for bone grafting, especially in radiation therapy, because radiation therapy, as I hope you know, will retard this big time. And it's a little bit controversial if you think about it with joint replacement, what type of cup we put in. Do we put in a cemented cup? Or do we put in an uncemented cup, especially if the patient is having radiation treatment? That's a good question to ask yourself and a good question to go through the pros and the cons because 
An uncemented cup relies on bony on growth, but you've got a sick patient with a poor bone marrow and who's getting radiation treatment. So is there going to be bony on growth there? In my opinion, a cemented cup is probably the right way to go, especially in those cancers that have a poorer prognosis, because it will give you immediate stability. You're not relying on any bony ingrowth, um, and the patient is not going to need it for very long. However, and I hope you know that there are cemented cups that can last a very long time. If you are going to do uncemented for those patients who you think are going to live for a long time, I would advise screw augmentation. And one of the principles and workup of these um, patients with metastatic bone disease is to do an x-ray of the entire bone from top, from joint above to joint below, looking for other metastases. And if you are doing a joint replacement, look at doing a long stem. A little bit like your nail where you'd, you'd want to use the fattest, longest nail. The same principle holds with the stem. And of course, that stem will be cemented in 100% of cases. Endoprosthetics are there to replace bone. They're used when nailing or arthroplasty not possible. They have a number of advantages which we will go through and are used especially when you're more aggressive in solitary or oligometastatic disease. The internal fixation, high failure rate, load bearing. Locking plates can be used and I'll show you an example of these. This is usually in, in um, smaller metastases metastases that are in the metaphysis of bones um, and ones that are amenable to plating, usually of the upper limb, occasionally in the lower limb. We give post-op radiotherapy. Because this is a curatage, we of course are doing a marginal resection, leaving tumor cells behind. And the other role of radiation is then to mop up any remaining cancer cells. A lot of, ex lot of uh, pros to endoprosthetics, eh? Strong, durable, they don't break unless you use too thin a stem, which you shouldn't. Uh, you allow, they allow immediate weight bearing, immediate stability as they are cemented. So if you have someone tell you just to slide a nail in or see if you can get it in and wait for union and then try to replace the joint, I would advise against that. Remember, we want to get it right first time. We want one operation here. We don't want to see the patient again. So if you think it's going to fail, rather do something more aggressive in the beginning because it'll benefit your patient later. The advantages of the endo is that you can resect the whole metastasis. And certainly you do this if you're doing for a solitary metastasis, you'll excise it with a wide margin. Uh, you have a predictable outcome, so you're not waiting for the effectiveness of radiotherapy and to control pain or assist with fracture union. Um, funny enough, you have a low reoperation rate. The main thing is if your patient doesn't get infection, of course, the problems with these are infection and dislocation. But if you do your job properly, you maintain the capsule, you can, it's, it, the rehab is exactly the same as a total hip replacement. It's only in the big sarcomas where you're cutting out a lot of muscle and a lot of stabilizing uh, structures that you have a high dislocation rate. But we mobilize our proximal femurs exactly the same as a joint replacement. And they're used for we have, when you have large metaf uh, metastases around the metaphysis, low volume disease, as I've mentioned. And when you predict there will be a poor response or there has been a poor response to non-surgical treatment. Amputation, not often done, but needing a mention in the situation. A little bit like the scenario where you have a fungating breast primary. Uh, if you metastases very occasionally can be large and aggressive. And the advantage of an amputation is that it's one operation with a predictable outcome. However, you do have to warn the patient about phantom limb pain and it's usually done for a fungating tumor or that tumor which is compromising the neovascular structures and nailing or endoprosthetic replacement or joint replacement is not going to change that and they're going to be in pain after the operation. 
So we, I think we start here with some surgical options moving from the pelvis down the leg, and then we'll go to the upper limb. This is, of course, an MRI scan showing a right-sided acetabular met that is aggressive, that is destroying bone, and there's a lot of edema around it. Remember, unfortunately, I don't have the X-ray, a pre-op X-ray of this patient, but the MRI will often overcall things, especially on the T2-weighted imaging, because a lot of it looks white. And it looks like there's a lot of information, and you think, crikey, this is a large met. In this, certain, in this particular circumstance, the X-ray correlated with the MRI, and she had a very large, aggressive renal cell metastasis here. Um, unfortunately, at this point, I'd probably ask you some of you questions about how you'd prepare for this type of surgery. Um, there is a slide later on on the bleeding risk of metastases and when you curatage them. Essentially, in pelvic lesions that are large and aggressive, I think that a CT angio is important. And if you've got a good radiolog a radiologist who can do embolization, then I would embolize the feeding vessels to this tumor, which is undoubtedly going to be very vascular. A good multiple choice question would be to ask you what vessel should you not embolize? And there are two main vessels here that supply this area of the body. One is the superior gluteal artery and the other one is the inferior gluteal artery. Inferior supplies internal structures, inferior internal. And you can embolize that pretty much with abandon. The superior gluteal artery supplies the gluteus maximum maximus and the skin around your buttock and if the radiologist gets too trigger happy with his pellets and embolizes the SGA you can get necrosis of the buttock which is a disaster so in this situation what can we do surgically well there's clearly a pathological fracture here the patient's in a lot of pain a normal hip replacement's not going to do so you can do a cone cup, which is what I did, which allows for fixation in the strong part of the ileum. It bypasses your fracture. You can then you can see the cement surrounding the neck of the cone cup. It's called a cone cup because it looks like an ice cream cone upside down. Um, it's modular. It's off the shelf um, and is a good option. And you can get away with a small standard cemented femoral stem. Yeah, some tumor surgeons will resect the proximal femur and do a proximal femoral replacement. I think that this adds cost to the procedure. It uh, causes much more dissection, much more blood loss. However, what it does do, it does allow you better visualization of the problem and allows you to place your cone cup a lot more easily. This is inserted through an anterolateral approach. You can't do it through a posterior approach, which we've learned by trial and error. Other options here would include a custom acetabulum. Although some people have done this, I don't think it's a good idea because a custom acetabulum takes a minimum of two weeks to print. So you're going to leave your patient lying in bed for two weeks while you print it. I don't think so. You could possibly do a cage with a big um, Harrington rods, which go from the top of the ileum down into the pubic symphysis. You can see here though that the inferior, uh, su sorry, superior pubic ramus is, um, is eaten away. So you have to make sure you've got good bone there. Proximal femur is a, th a third of, of, of bone mets present there. And because it's a high, area of the body where there's a, a lot of weight going through it, there's a higher risk of fracture. If there's a metastasis of the femoral head, and guys, please assess this, especially when putting in a nail. Usually the nails we put in for metastatic disease lock into the head and neck and distally. If you have a metastasis in the femoral head, you can't do a nail. So you must do a cemented hemi or total. Uh, it, if cost is an issue, do a cemented hemi. I still think this should be a bipolar rather than a Thompson or, yeah, you know, I think a Thompson's a horrific thing to put in someone uh, and you, you've got no ability to get it 
as you would like it in terms of offset and length. I normally do totals. Um, and then again, remember, consider a long stem, depending on the extent of your metastasis. And a good principle is to take an extra of the whole bone. Pathological fractures or mets around the femoral neck is quite straightforward. It's a cemented hemi or total. Any pertrochanteric mets, you're looking at an IM nail if your prognosis is poor and you've got good bone stock in the femoral head and neck or you're looking at a proximal femur. If it was me, I would probably have a opt for a proximal femur even if I have poor prognosis because I know that I can get up, mobilize on that immediately. I know my pain, my metastatic pain is going to be gone. My incisional pain will go in a week or two and I can get on with whatever time I have left. I wouldn't want to nail, even with cement, although the pain scores are better, you're still on crutches and you're going to hobble around like that until you die. It's a bit depressing. So these are plain form x-rays, as you can see with a left-sided femoral neck metastasis. You can see the lytic nature, I hope, when comparing it to the right side. Unfortunately, the patient then fractured and ended up having a proximal femoral replacement. We're not going to go through this now. Um, that's more for this, the oncology surgical talk. But this is an example of a, a hemi. That's telling was not replaced. That's a bipolar neck because she was a privately paying patient. And um, we try to save costs and her prognosis was poor. You can see there's a little plate on um, where the greater trochanter was, that's securing the abductors and the uh, vastus lateralis to the prosthesis until it heals. There's a screw hole there, that hole you can see is a screw hole. There was no screw placed in that. It was sometimes those screws don't go in. It's a, it's a disaster. Remember the collar, which is around the femoral diathesis, that's for bony on growth if your patient lives long enough. And of course, the stem is cemented. Subtrochanteric. I am nail only really with very limited life expectancy. Screws up the neck. Some people you could you could use a DHS. I would not advise that. That's in the BOOS, which is the British uh, Orthopedic Oncology, Oncology Society guidelines as a DHS with some cement augmentation, but it'd have to be a long plate and I, would, I wouldn't advise that. I think it'd fail. I think a nail would be a much better solution if you uh, don't want to put in an endoprosthetic but I would do an endoprosthetic. And then periprosthetic. So sometimes either the patient's had a hip replacement before and has METS now surrounding it or a, or a knee replacement, or you've done a procedure and the METS progressed. Um, you could stabilize this with plates and cement or an endoprosthetic. Again, I would lean towards an endoprosthesis. In the diaphysis, I'm now Fine, lock up the neck into the head, lock distally. You want a solid nail if possible, or at least one with the largest diameter. Usually this is not a problem because the Mets have eroded bone. And then of course, in all of these cases, you want post-op radiation. Solitary metastasis is you, used to be an IM nail if palliative. However, we're more aggressive with these and we would resect the MET and do an intercalary device. That's basically a block of titanium that is screwed together with stems proximally and distally. If there's a major defect, for example, a circumferential defect that's a few centimeters long and the patient's fractured through it, as I said before, it really does help when, with, with post-op pain scores if you resect that net, curatage and pack it with cement. And if you think about it, you, you're gonna insert a nail with screws up the neck and distally, and if you keep the patient to their correct length, you're gonna have a hole there and the nail is bound to break. Around the distal femur, one can use plate fixation with cement augmentation. I'll show an example later of one where you could have done that, but I chose to do an inner prosthesis. Um, usually a, a DFR, a distal femur replacement, is used when there's significant bone loss or a good prognosis. 
This is in the proximal tibia is one place where you probably wouldn't use an inner prosthetic. You might you'd probably use a plate with locking screws. And that is because the proximal tibial replacement is our worst operation functionally. It re requires removal of the extensor mechanism, which is incredibly difficult to attach to a piece of metal. Um, you could do it if you really had to, there was no bone stock, but you have to warn the patient that they will undoubtedly have a 45 degree extensor lag. We do better with our sarcomas when we have a longer time for them to rehab. And um, we put them in a, in a ROM brace with gradual increases in flexion. However, in metastatic disease, you want the patient to be able to get up and go. And um, so, and you want them to be functional, of course. So if you're not getting the function, you shouldn't do that operation. Distal tibia, uh, you, can, you can treat conservatively. You can put in a locking plate with, with cement augmentation. You could do an amputation. We do have distal tibial replacements for this type of problem. They're not very common, but they are an option. This is a case that I mentioned earlier that you might do a curatage and cementoma with, with a locking plate, although it's on the medial side. You can see the MET involves a little bit of the epiphysis and, and, the, and the metaphysis. It's fairly large. Um, I chose to do an endoprosthetic. I was glad that I did because it, um, you know, the bone actually was extremely weak. And if we did an MRI scan and it shows the MET to be a lot more extensive than on the X-ray. This is an example of the striker GMRS. I did that because she was British and going back to England. Um, this particular distal femur does not have a collar, which is one of its failings and which is why I don't use it. Um, and you must be careful if you can see the flare of the distal femur. If your collar is smaller than that, then the prosthesis can subside, or you do a shorter distal femur, the prosthesis can subside into the bone. So you must make sure that your collar is bearing on cortical bone. And this is a rotating platform. And it, although it's a hinge, it's... Um, it's not a fixed hinge, and the survival rates of these are 80%, 87% of 10 years. So all the time, the, the arthroplasty knee surgeons quote you that uh, hinges are, in, are, are wrong. That's based on old data of fixed hinges, where the forces through them, tibia, were, were far greater than this particular construct. Moving on to the upper limb. Scapula and clavic, a lot of the upper limb, really, you could probably get away without surgery unless the pain was very, very bad. Uh, most of the time you can get away with radiotherapy and a sling. So in the humerus, a lot of the time, especially with more proximal metastases, you can use a locking plate with cement augmentation, which I'll show you an example of just now, or you can do cast bracing with radiotherapy, especially in radiosensitive tumors like multiple myeloma. Renal cell carcinoma, not so much a radiosensitive tumor. We go through these tumors and their sensitivities in the oncology lecture later in the program. Uh, proximal humerus. So if there's bone loss, if, if there's a bone available proximally this lead, you can use a nail. Um, if there's significant bone loss, one can perform an arthroplasty, but it's usually a proximal humerus with reverse. Um, and that is because often you, there's no, not enough bone to put a stem into. So you're doing this operation mainly because there's no bone, so you can't use a, a standard arthroplasty. You have to replace that bone. So this is the example. I'm sure you can appreciate the fracture that's there, the surgical neck of the humerus. You can appreciate the lytic nature of the lesion and the metaphysis and head. And in this situation, I thought there was enough bone proximally towards the joint and distally that I could get away with a plate and screws. And here you just fill up those screw holes proximally and distally. A lot of the fracture principles go out the window here. You curatage the mitt, you pack the cement in, and while it's soft, you insert your 
screws. So those screws are holding both in bone and cement. And because there's not a lot of force going through the upper limb, generally this does not become weak or doesn't fail. For diaphyseal, one can use nails, one can use uh, intercalary devices, as mentioned previously with the femur. Um, and of course, you can use plates as well if you want to. Plates aren't as good as nails, so I'd, I'd encourage using nails over plates. Distal humeral metastases, one can do a replacement, a distal humerus replacement. Um, if it's periarticular, you can try your locking plates and cement. For arm plate cement, what I haven't mentioned here is an intercalary. And this example is of a, this lady had a breast CA met uh, of about five centimeters in her ulna. And she had a intercalary this, uh, prosthesis inserted. So you can see there are two H forks or collars that go on either side of the bone, proximally and distally. This allows, it gives some torsional stability allows bony on growth while this um, um, and this the cemented stems give it stability while that happens. In this particular so, uh, scenario, there are two mandrels there, which are these two blocks of titanium and those jackknife together. And the humerus and the femur, they are two plates that slot into one another and are attached by screws. But this allows the patient to mobilize immediately to get full supination, pronation back, um, keeps it out to length, remove and solves a pain problem. So bleeding is, of course, when you're curataging the MET, you want to know whether or not you're going to bleed a lot, because usually these patients uh, have a depressed bone marrow, they don't have high hemoglobins to begin with. Um, you're doing an operation which is bloody already, and now you're going to curatage a MET, Are they, is it going to bleed? The main, any MET can bleed, that's the basic principle. But the larger, more aggressive, more lytic the MET is, the more you can predict it's going to bleed. Renal cell is a known offender. Thyroid, although unusual, can bleed a lot. And when I say unusual, I mean you don't often get a lot of thyroid METs. Lung cancer, definitely. Multiple myeloma, for sure. So larger lesions in the pelvis beware and be prepared. So I get a CT angiogram with pelvic lesions and I ask the uh, radiologist to embolize. Large aggressive lesions in the limbs where you can get proximal control, I don't tend to uh, get angiograms or embolize for um, because you should be able to control the bleeding in that situation. Watch out for multiple myeloma and bone marrow transplants. A lot of multiple myeloma patients have bone marrow transplants, which creates havoc when trying to cross-match um, cross blood for them. We had a case where the, luckily we had a cell saver, which is another thing that I advise you having on board when doing these cases and when, you've, when you think there might be bleeding. Um, if the patient has widespread metastases anyway, the risk of a cell saver is minimal, especially with the modern day filters that are able to fil filter out the larger cancer cells. Okay, so they, it's all about size. The cancer cells are big, red blood cells are small, so they filter them out. And I don't believe you get an increase in metastatic disease when using a cell saver. So I often have a cell saver, especially with pelvic cases. Now, luckily, the, in this situation, the cell saver saved the patient's life because he had had three bone marrow transplants. We could not cross-match any blood for him, and we got blood only 12 hours later. So watch out for that. If there's widespread metastases and risk of bone marrow depression, I ask for a clotting profile as well so that you can plan what you order from the blood bank. You may need um, FFPs. This is, these are examples of cement augmentation. When you're using cement, if you're going to be injecting it into nails or through nails or through holes, one should use a low viscosity cement. So make sure that you have that on the, on the shelf. If not, order it in. As I said before, they help with the pain scores. 
and um, they also help with local progression of disease. So those that are cemented, cemented have a much lower progression of disease, and that's thought to be due to the thermal setting of cement. I'm not sure I buy that, but it's a theory that, that um, is given in giant cell tumor of bone as well, and it may be true, I'm not sure. That picture on the right with the nail and looks like the cement dripping out of its proximal screws, you can see that defect in the diaphysis. So if you just nailed that and didn't cement it, the patient would continue to be in a lot of pain. Basically, you've done an operation for nothing, and that would eventually fail, in my opinion. And there are there are nails that, um, like the, um, I think there's a synthes nail which does allow injection of cement. If you are worried about a lytic lesion in the neck and the head, you can uh, order that nail and inject cement into that area. It will help you with your stability. Some complications, don't forget the, um, the treatment can be worse than the disease. This is uh, um, radiation induced pathological fracture. It's something that I mentioned pretty much in all these talks because I, it, it requires a very high index of suspicion because it's not a very common finding. But if you see what looks like a stress fracture in a patient who's had radiation there, consider a radiation-induced pathological fracture. Don't fix it with internal fixation like an iron nail or DHS. It will not heal because that bone is dead. It needs an endoprosthetic replacement. This was one where um, I thought that uh, the fracture was pathological. You can see the um, pre-ops x-rays there that show minimally displaced or valgus impacted garden type one fracture, I think, um, in a patient with known colorectal metastatic disease. Um, it turns out, however, that on the um, head that was sent away in biopsies that this was just, an, there was no evidence of, of metastatic disease. And this was due to osteoporosis because of the treatment she'd been on. She was on high dose steroids to control her pain. She'd had radiotherapy before, and of course, chemotherapy can depress your bone marrow. And she had been in a wheelchair and has disuse atrophy. So for, she had a lot of reasons to be osteoporotic and have a fracture. However, you still biopsy it, you still send the specimen away and you treat it as if it was pathological. And not much new in, in iron, iron nailing of metastatic bone disease, but this is an example of a peak nail uh, or carbon fiber nails. They are available. Um, I haven't seen them in South Africa, but certainly overseas they're available. They're quite useful in that they reduce, reduce the scatter of the radiation that you give to the, the MET and therefore improve healing. So with a titanium nail, when you give the radiation treatment, there's a lot of scatter and a lot of the dose doesn't get to the area of metastasy behind the nail um, it, it, and there's some sort of soft in, softer um, benefits like improved surveillance of the metastasy because you're not blocked by the nail so you can see whether there's local recurrence or progression um, you can see whether there's response to radiotherapy or chemotherapy um, It has some disadvantages. This is a fairly old slide. They used to only be able to make peak in a straight line and um, they're not cannulated. Um, so if you've got a very elderly patient with a curved femur, that can be problematic, but I think they are producing nails that are have a better curvature to them to allow for this. And then of course, because you can't see them really very well, there can be some locking difficulties. Okay, so that is metastatic bone disease that I have for you this evening. Um, are there any questions?